right, time to unleash the worst kept secret at the bridge, which is that today we are beginning a new sermon series in the book of Romans. Woo, okay, that was, that was weak. We're gonna be in it for a while, guys, so you better get excited about it. We, uh, my intention is that we're gonna go through this whole book, line by line, which will probably take us till the end of 2025, maybe, uh, with some breaks for summer and Christmas and so on. But I'm, I'm excited about this, and I've heard from others uh, their excitement as well. For me, there's also a bit of weightiness, because I know how God has used this book to bring transformation to many people, and I don't, I don't want us to miss what God has for us in this. I don't want to miss what God has for me in this. Because um, I, I don't know how you'd measure this, but I would think that there is maybe not another book of the Bible that has had a, as big an impact on the history of the church. For example, there was a guy named Augustine, 4th, 5th century, North African guy. He was brilliant. He loved philosophy and he loved women. And he was prolific in both. He advanced, somebody said, woo. He uh, advanced in academia, uh, had a lot of romantic relationships, but had this deep unsettledness in his, in his spirit. And, and he tried a whole bunch of different philosophies and was exposed to some Christian preaching and had a Christian mother who encouraged him as well. Um, but there was this, this fight going on inside of him until one day he hears this he hears this child singing a song. He's outside in the garden. He hears this, this child singing uh, a song he never heard before. It went something like this. Pick it up and read. Pick it up and read. I don't, I don't know if that's how it went. Uh, but those were the words, at least. I'm going to be on the worship team next week. Don't worry. You just watch. Uh, so pick it up and read. So he took this as a kind of a message from God to pick up a Bible and read it. And so he, he opens up a Bible, and the very first thing he sees, like the very first verse his eyes lay, lay sight on, uh, was Romans 13, verses 13 and 14, which talk about not satisfying the desires of the flesh, but instead putting on Christ. And this for him was this total epiphany moment where he gave his life to Jesus, surrendered his life to Christ, ended up becoming a pastor, became a bishop, ended up being the most influential theologian in the church from probably the early church all the way till the, the uh, kind of the Protestant Reformation. And it all started with, with Romans. Now that Protestant Reformation I just mentioned was kicked off by a German monk, Roman Catholic monk named Martin Luther. And Luther, uh, kind of like Augustine, had this, this fight going on inside of him. For him, it was this unresolved guilt and shame. And uh, his, his job as a monk, as a priest, offered him no comfort at all. He, in fact, he hated one verse in particular. Romans 1 verse 17. Couldn't stand this verse. We're going to look at it next week. It talks about the righteousness of God being revealed. And for, for Luther, this was bad news. Because it meant that God is righteous and he is not. And therefore, God is pursuing him to punish him, to judge him. That he was doomed to live under God's wrath. So he couldn't stand this verse. He couldn't let it go. He was like a dog on a bone, just like chewing on this thing over and over again until one day he as well had an epiphany where he realized that actually this righteousness of God is a gift from God to us that we don't deserve. That by grace, through faith in Jesus, we are declared to be righteous. We are declared to be in right standing with God. And Luther said that this changed everything for him, that it was like the clouds had parted and that he had entered into paradise itself. And again, it started with Romans. Now, a couple hundred years after that, there was uh, an Englishman named John Wesley. He was uh, in that same Protestant kind of stream of things. He was a, a pastor and a missionary. His missionary thing didn't go very well, ended up back in England. But he, on the outside, was about as good and pious a man as you would ever find. And, uh, and yet, it was all external. It was all just a show, more or less. He knew it didn't hit his heart. He saw the difference it made for other people. And this caused him to struggle too. And by the way, I look at all three of these guys and I just think if, if there is a question in your life, if there is something that you're wrestling with God about, that's not a bad thing. That in fact, wrestling with him might actually be what precipitates real breakthrough, something that he uses to, to speak into your life in a pretty powerful way. 
So, so uh, Wesley's struggling with this. He walks into a Christian meeting that's happening on Aldersgate Street in London, and you'll never guess what the facilitator was reading. No, not Romans. It's close. I, I tricked you there. Close. It was Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. So you were close. Um, but he's listening to Martin Luther's commentary on Romans, which I don't know if that would be especially what we would want to be listening to, but he's listening to it and, and suddenly it just hits him. And he wrote in his journal later, and these are famous words in church history, he said that as he listened to Martin Luther's teaching about Romans, that his heart was strangely warmed within him and that he believed maybe for the first time in his life that God really did love him and that the gospel was good news for him too. Now, I don't know if we've got any Augustines or Luthers or Wesleys among us, but what I, I do pray, and what I ask you to pray for as well, is that as we go through this book together, that just like the gospel became more real and more deeply rooted for each of those three guys, that it would be for each one of us. That we would know more fully than we've ever known before what Jesus has done for us, and that there would be this joy that overflows from us, and that just as God kind of used Romans to change the course of history through guys like this, that God would use Romans to change the course even of our church to make us more and more the church that he wants us to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pray for that as we begin. Lord, I thank you for this, this gift that the letter to the Romans is and has been in church history. We thank you for how you have used it, Lord, to bring life and renewal uh, in so many ways that, that through Augustine and, and Luther and Wesley and many others, Lord, you have brought gospel renewal to dry places, barren places. Lord, I, I pray that you would do it again. Do it again in our day, Lord that you would use this letter and what it says about the gospel, about who Jesus is and what he has done. Use it, Lord, to bring us to life. Use it to bring our church even more to life, Lord, that we would be so filled with the grace and peace that comes from the gospel that it would just overflow from us. May it be in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, well, we are still not ready to open up this letter. Because, and this is kind of like when I was a kid at Christmas at extended family gatherings, it drove me crazy because all the gifts would be there just waiting there, but we had to go around and everybody had to share their highlight of the year. And as a kid, I frankly don't care what my uncle and aunt did in July. I want to open up the present right now, right? Some of you are like, I just want to, I want to read Romans. I want to open it up. Patience. Just have patience, my young friends and old friends. We will get there. But I want, I want to look at the context of this letter. Uh, and, and actually, the reason I want to do that gets to something that we believe at the very core of our faith, which is that God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. It's what we read in John 1. That God is not a, a distant God who stays detached from the situations of our lives, but that he's a God who genuinely loves us, works in our stories, works in our lives, works in the very real situations that we encounter back then just as today. And so Romans is known as this book of like serious theology, and it is. But it's not this theology that's above the clouds, kind of dropped down to us without context. It's, it's God's living word. It's, it's his word for life, for our lives, for our world today. So, so I want to go into some of the context for that reason. This is a letter uh, that Paul, a guy named Paul, writes to the church in Rome, the Christians in Rome. And some of you maybe know a lot about Paul if you were with us through Acts. Maybe you feel like you know Paul a little bit too well. But others of you don't. So here's a quick bio of Paul. He was, he was a Jew in the first century, born around the same time as Jesus. And he was uh, a member of the sect called the Pharisees. He was a rising star. He was a wunderkind. That's German for wonder kid, if you didn't know. He was, he was brilliant. And so he's advancing in Judaism. He was especially passionate about stamping out this movement of Jews believing in Jesus as Messiah. Thought that was the worst thing. And so he would go from place to place, 
rounding up Christians, arresting them, at least in one instance, actually overseeing the execution of a Christian. And so one day he's on his way to a city called Damascus in modern day Syria to participate in his favorite pastime, persecuting Christians. And he's on his way and suddenly he is struck by this blinding light and he sees and hears the resurrected Jesus. And he realizes right there at that moment that he had perhaps been wrong about Jesus, that in fact, a lot of his life had been lived for the wrong purposes in the wrong direction. And, and so actually in that moment, even Jesus says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something very different with you, Paul. I'm gonna call you to go and to tell both Jews and Gentiles about me. So Paul goes from being prime persecutor of the church to becoming maybe the primary promoter of Jesus. And Paul says this himself in his letters, that he, his life is an example of God's grace and his kindness. That if any of you look at your life and you think, man, I, where, where I've been, what I've done, how far I've gone off track in the past, just look at Paul and know that God's grace is sufficient for you in Christ Jesus. Don't ever think, oh, I'm, I'm beyond God's redemption. There's no hope for me. The fact that you're sitting here, that you're listening to this says, God is not done with you, that he wants to do something in your life, do something with your story. If he could do it with Paul, he'll do it with you. So Paul spends maybe the next 20 years or so going around the Mediterranean world, uh, preaching about Jesus, planting churches. And by the way, we've got, a, we've got a timeline here. These are approximate dates. So if you go Google this later on and you're like, ah, oh, Craig was wrong about these dates. I don't want that email, okay? This is, these are, these are approximates. Maybe it was different. Maybe it wasn't exactly these years, but approximately, this is when it, it stuff happens. 20 years, he's, he's planting churches around 57 AD. Paul is, uh, he's in the Greek city of Corinth and he writes this letter to the church in Rome, a church that he had never visited before. So he writes this letter and he tells them, look, I've got some travel plans. And he tells them that what he has been doing but he's undertaken a pretty significant project. He's been going around to these different churches, especially to the Gentiles, and he's been raising an offering. He's been getting people to give some of their resources because he wants to bring that to Jerusalem to help the poverty-stricken believers in Jerusalem, uh, the Jewish believers. And this is not just a humanitarian project for Paul. This is a way that he wants to cultivate unity in the church to bring healing to these strained and broken relationships between Jews and Gentiles. That's Paul's heart, is for the unity of the church. And may that be our heart too, that we would go to great lengths to maintain the unity of the church and to establish those relationships. So Paul says, I'm gonna go to Jerusalem, I'm gonna bring this money. I don't know if you had like one of those really big checks. I feel like that would have been a lot of fun, but he's going to bring this to them. Uh, and then he wants to go to Spain. And this isn't a vacation. He's not going to like Malaga and hanging out on the beach. He wants to go to Spain because Spain is a region, the furthest West in the Roman empire that has not yet heard about Jesus. And this is what he's passionate about more than anything else is proclaiming Christ where he has not been proclaimed yet. So he says, I'm, I'm, I wanna go to Jerusalem, then I'm gonna go to Spain, and on my way from east to west, I'm gonna pass through Rome, and I wanna visit you. Again, he had never visited the church there before. He badly wanted to, so he's writing this letter, kind of paving the way, saying, here's my plan. Now, Paul did end up in Rome three years later, but not at all the way that he was expecting to. So if you were with us in Acts, you'll remember that he ends up in Jerusalem, drops off the money, and then is promptly arrested for his preaching about Jesus. He gets put through the whole ringer of the Roman legal system. He appeals to Caesar, and a few years later, he finally ends up in Rome, but now he's in chains. Not at all the way he was expecting. He's in chains, but he's there visiting the Christians and, and so on. And then we don't really know what happens to him after that. There's a chance that Paul was eventually released, that he did go to Spain, and then came back to Rome in the mid-60s. We think it's pretty, pretty certain that he got back in the mid-60s just in time to be beheaded by Emperor Nero, because you want to make sure you make that appointment. You don't want to em disappoint Emperor Nero. So, so we're pretty sure that he gets martyred at that point. And so that, that's kind of Paul's story and how Romans fits into all of that. I wanna tell you about the church in Rome as well, because I think this is, this is interesting. Um, 
Roman Catholic tradition has Peter, as far as I know, kind of establishing the church in Rome, becoming essentially the bishop, the first pope, and, and you get this whole line afterwards. My understanding, even from church history and from the scriptures, is that's probably not what actually happened. I know. Uh, but probably you've got Roman Jews who are in Jerusalem for Pentecost. That's the day in Acts 2 where the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church. It's like the birthday of the church. Thousands of people baptized. We know that there were people from Rome there. They probably received Jesus, go back to Rome, and start spreading the news there. The church grows in Rome, and around 49 AD, tensions are getting high. Because you remember, you remember how Paul was really determined to stamp this whole movement of Jewish believers in Jesus out. You remember that? It was like five minutes ago. I hope you remember that. Uh, so other people felt the same way. This was pretty widespread. And so you've got a lot of hostility from Jewish believers toward, Jewish non-believers towards Jewish believers. And Emperor Claudius in 49 AD says, I've had enough, all of you out of the city now. Like all the Jews, whether you believe or not, you're all kicked out. You can't live in Rome anymore. This happens historically, uh, which is actually how Paul meets Priscilla and Aquila, two of his closest friends are, are Jews who had been expelled from Rome. So in those uh, in those years following, the church continues to grow, but now entirely among Gentiles. The Jews are, are probably welcomed back to Rome after Claudius dies in 54 AD, but they come back to a church that's now predominantly Gentile. And then Paul writes this letter, like three years after that, 57 AD. And think about the tensions in Rome. You've got this hostility that exists between Jews, whether they believe in Jesus or not. There's this hostility there. And then you've got a church that has become mostly Gentile. And, and maybe some of these Gentiles, by the way, Gentile just being a word that means non-Jewish, maybe these Gentiles are kind of thinking, you know, we were doing pretty well without you guys. Actually, it was a little bit easier. We didn't have to worry about your scruples about our differences. And, and so you got attention there, and all of that is going to factor in to what Paul says in Romans. All of that is going to be part of the, the context, the background for what he says in this letter. Now, again, I know that that's a lot of history. Some of you are not into that kind of thing. I'm sorry if that's you. I really love this kind of stuff. But again, just to say this is, this is core to who we are as Christians, the belief that God works in history, works in our contexts, that he is not a distant God, aloof from our problems, but that, that his word speaks right into our lives today. We might not be the church in Rome. We might be the church here in North Vancouver, but the book of Romans is for us. It is for our lives today. So having said all of that, are we ready? Are you primed? Are you excited? Wow, that was a lot of interaction right there. Good work. Okay, Romans 1. We're going to do the first seven verses today. This is what we read. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is, this is Paul's intro. This is his introduction to the letter. And, and I wanna look at four subjects that he introduces that are gonna keep on coming back throughout this letter. And I would say individuals, but one of them isn't a, a person. So we'll say four subjects. And the first is Paul himself as the author, the guy writing this letter. And he's got a pretty fascinating story. We talked about that before. There's a lot he could say to introduce himself to a church that hasn't actually met him. Most of them haven't met him. But what does he introduce himself with? He simply says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. This is who he is. Above all else, he's a servant. He is at the disposal of Jesus. This is what he lives his life for. Whatever Jesus says, that's what he wants to do. 
He is guided by Jesus. Jesus gets to call the shots in his life. And this is, this is a statement actually about his identity. And to me, that's so important because we live in a world where, there, where identity is a really big deal and there's a lot of confusion about identity. How do you know who you really are? It feels like it's up for grabs in our world today. Is it just based on what you feel about yourself, what you decide about yourself, what other people say about you? How do I know who I am? And Paul, for Paul, it was pretty simple. I am a servant of Jesus. My identity is based on my relationship to him. And that's solid because Jesus is solid. It's a lot more solid than our feelings or other people's opinions of us. I am a servant of Jesus, he says. And then he says that he is an apostle. And that word, apostle, means that he is like an authorized representative. That when he goes and he speaks, that he is speaking the words of the Lord. It's kind of like if you have an ambassador who is uh, sent by a president or a prime minister to go uh, and speak the message that the president has given them, right? That's the idea. This person, it's as if the president was there himself. And this is, this is Paul as an apostle of Jesus. It's why his words have authority for the Romans, even though he hasn't met them. And it's actually partly why his words have authority for us, because Paul had been called to be an apostle. And this was work to speak the Lord's words to people. This was a calling he received right there on, on the road to Damascus. That Jesus said, you're going to be my apostle to the Gentiles to tell them about Jesus. And, and this is a statement about his purpose. And purpose as well is something that people struggle with in our world, right? What am I supposed to do in life? Not just who I am I, but what am I supposed to do? Some of us still don't know what we're going to do when we grow up, right? We're still struggling with that. But for, for a lot of us, it's like purpose has to go deeper. It's got to go deeper than just my job. It's got to go deeper than just making money or, or living, you know, at peace with my family, getting through Thanksgiving dinner with my family. Like it's got to be more than that, right? It's got to be more, be more deeply rooted than that. And here's Paul saying, my purpose is to, to proclaim the gospel. He was, he was solid about his identity. He was solid about his purpose. Proclaim the gospel. Now that's the second subject we want to talk about, is the gospel. So uh, this is one of these words, I think, that is like Christianese. I know some of you speak Christianese, some of you know that language. This is like the, the Christian vocabulary that you just say words that you think everybody knows what you mean, but actually you're not, you're not clear on it at all. So gospel is one of those words. So let's define it first. Gospel, the basic meaning of it is good news or good announcement. So the way it would be used in the first century would be you might have a king or a governor who wins a battle on some battlefield and sends word back to the capital about this victory. And that would be a gospel, the good announcement that a victory has been won. You're bringing news of that back. So here we read about the gospel of God. This is, this is the good announcement of a victory that God has brought about. And Paul says that this news, this announcement, had been promised beforehand by God through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. That this didn't come out of the blue, but that God told us years and years in advance how he was going to win this battle. Which is incredible when you think about it. Because we as humans try to do this sometimes and we don't do very well with it. I actually Googled. I wanted to come up with an illustration for you. So I Googled famous failed guarantees. And all I got were pages of articles about Trump's failed campaign promises. It was like, that's not at all what I was asking for, Google, but thanks for telling me how you think I should vote in the next election. <laughs> um, but politicians, of course, they do this, make promises, don't fulfill it. I think also about sports, you know, athletes and, and others making guarantees. Famously, um, when LeBron James left his hometown Cleveland Cavaliers to go to the Miami Heat, uh, this is like 15 years ago, the owner of the Cavaliers was so incensed about this that he, he sent out a letter that kind of like the whole sport, sports world saw. And it was in like Comic Sans font for some reason, which didn't help with like the sense of seriousness to the letter. But he guaranteed, he said, I promise you, I guarantee you that we will win a championship in Cleveland before LeBron does. That didn't age well at all. <laughs> Cavaliers quickly became the worst team in the league. LeBron won a couple of championships and so on. So we were, the point is we're bad at this. We're fickle. 
we're weak, we don't know if we're gonna win the victory or how we're gonna do it. But we read here that God does know and that he actually told us many times through the prophets, years in advance, how he was gonna do it. You think about a passage like Isaiah 53, written half a millennium before Jesus, and you, you read words like this. It just describes the cross. Here's God saying, this is how I am going to win the victory over sin, over evil, over these greatest of enemies. I'm gonna do it this way. And you could go back even further. Some people would point to Genesis 3. This is right at the beginning of the Bible after Adam and Eve have eaten the fruit. They've sinned. Sin is now part of the picture. And God speaks to the serpent who had tempted uh, Eve. And he says to the serpent that there is going to be hostility between her and the, and the serpent, between Eve and the, and the serpent, and that one of her descendants, he, that the serpent is going to strike his heel and that this descendant will crush the serpent's head. Right there, it seems that God is saying, this is how I'm going to defeat you, serpent, who we understand to be Satan. You're gonna, you're gonna strike a male descendant's heel of this woman and he's gonna crush your head. Right there in Genesis 3, from the beginning, God's saying, this is how I'm gonna do it. This is how I'm gonna win the victory. It's been promised long ago in advance. So you can trust the gospel that Paul preaches because it doesn't come out of nowhere. It's the fulfillment of all of these promises. And I, I would think that's compelling today too, to know that this didn't come out of nowhere, but that God told us way in advance what he was gonna do. And the, and the third thing about the gospel that Paul says here is that in the end, it's all about a person. And the gospel in the end is not a book. I think if you were to ask people on the street, what's the gospel? People would say, isn't that like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Like, isn't that one of like, the books of the Bible? And, and it is that. Like, they, it, we'd call them the gospel of John because it's John's proclamation of the gospel. But the gospel isn't a book. It's, it's not a list of rules. It's not even a belief statement. The gospel before anything else is good news, a good announcement about a person and about the victory that he has won. It is all about Jesus. And that's the third subject. That's the third subject that Paul introduces. I want you to clap, just not yet. It's coming. There's a moment coming. Uh, but the third subject that Paul introduces is, is Jesus. And he says a few important things about Jesus. He says, first of all, that according to the flesh, or as our, as our translation here has it, regarding his earthly life, that Jesus was a descendant of David. Now, if you don't know who David is, quick bio on him. He's famous for slaying the giant Goliath with a, a sling and a few stones. He became the king of Israel, ushered in the golden era for Israel. He loved the Lord. He was known as a man after God's own heart. And because of that, God made promises to him like this one in 1 Samuel 7. God said to David, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is what he says to David. And passages like this were why the Jews, even when, even when they were conquered and exiled, still held on to this hope that God was going to raise up a descendant of David, a king who would restore the glory of the nation. And they called this hope for a king, the anointed one. In Hebrew, that's translated as Messiah or Mashiach. In Greek, it would be the Christ, Christos. So in that way, by the way, Christ, if you're wondering, Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's, it's not like if you were, if he was like your substitute teacher in school, the principal wouldn't be like, hey, everybody, here's Mr. Christ. He's your teacher today. Uh, that's, it's not a name, it's a title. He's King Jesus. And one of the reasons we give him that title, one of the reasons that the early authors like Paul right away called him the Christ, one of the reasons was because Jesus actually was a descendant of King David. Both Matthew and Luke in their gospels, near the beginning, they trace the genealogy of Jesus. Probably one does it through Mary, the other one through Joseph, his adoptive father, but both trace his genealogy right back through King David. So he's a descendant of David, but if that's all you see about Jesus, you completely miss the picture because there were lots of descendants of David. Jesus is set apart from them for a bu another bunch of reasons, but one of them is what Paul says here, that God appointed through the spirit of holiness, a reference to the Holy Spirit, that Jesus was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. 
I'll talk about that whole appointed by God as, as, as son of God. That's a bit confusing. We'll come to that in a second, but let's start with the resurrection here that this was core to the Christian's proclamation from the beginning, that Jesus had truly conquered death, not just as a temporary resuscitation, not like somebody who is medically dead for half an hour and then comes back to life, but as somebody who was really and truly dead for a few days and then was resurrected in power in a new body that is no longer subject to death or decay. So Jesus rose from the dead. And this is not just wishful thinking. This isn't just like a warm, fuzzy belief. It wasn't just that the disciples were like, you know, I kind of feel like Jesus is still alive somehow, like in my heart. No, like like it was a literal physical resurrection that we actually would say we have more evidence for than most historical events. Actually, uh, N.T. Wright is a leading New Testament scholar, ancient literature scholar in general. And he looks at all of the the evidence for what happened on Easter Sunday, all the context. And he says in the end that in any other historical inquiry, the answer as to what happened would be so obvious that it would hardly need saying. When you look at the evidence, it's like, well, this is for sure the clearest explanation. It's just that a lot of people go, yeah, but dead people don't rise from the dead. So it it couldn't have happened but actually all the evidence points in that direction. And this was the Christian proclamation from the start that Jesus had conquered death. Now, what about this whole thing that that Paul says about Jesus being appointed the son of God in power? That makes it seem like he wasn't the son of God and then he rose from the dead and became the son of God. And that would be heresy. And I was told this week to keep my heresy to a dull roar. Somebody literally told me that. So no, that's, 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 we can see from the scriptures that that's not the case. But I don't think that person actually thinks I'm heretical. That was just a funny comment. I don't know why I said that. Anyways, um, so we can see from the scriptures that that's not the case, that it's not that Jesus just became the son of God after the resurrection. Even Paul right here, he describes Jesus as the son prior to talking about his descendant, descendancy from David or, or about his resurrection, that he was the son of God before all that. There was never a time when the son of God was not the son. John 1 for example, right at the beginning, says that the word of God, referring to Jesus, was with God in the beginning and was God. It's always been the son. So what changes in the resurrection is not his identity. What changes is his status and function in relation to the world. That in his incarnation, even the disciples who watched him do all these incredible things, they didn't really understand who he was. I mean, here he is, he's born... Uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a manger, he's born in these humble circumstances, a carpenter's son. He, he grows up kind of out of the spotlight, dies this humiliating death that was reserved for slaves and criminals. People didn't really understand who Jesus was. But in his resurrection, everything changes. Now, now you see him in his glory. Now you understand who he really is. This is why in Matthew 28, Jesus says after his resurrection that all authority in heaven and on earth has now been given to me. It's why we read in, in Philippians 2 that after Jesus humbled himself at the cross, dying this death, that God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And, and, and Philippians 2 starts out by saying Jesus was in very nature God, yet he emptied himself. He, he laid that down. He, he became one of us, but now God has exalted him and made his identity known to us that Jesus in his resurrection is declared to be king, that he is Lord, not Caesar, not the serpent, but Jesus is king and Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So so Paul's describing Jesus here. And then then fourth and finally, he introduces the Romans themselves. And he, remember that the the Roman church at this point was probably predominantly Gentile. And and so Paul speaks to these Gentiles in the church. And he's gonna speak to the Jews at, at times too. But he speaks to the Gentiles and he says, you too are called to belong to Jesus. That these Gentiles who 
once we're outside of this, these, these are promises. This is a story that Israel inherited. It was their thing. And yet now Paul is saying, you're part of it now too. And as far as I know, most of you are Gentiles. Uh, and a lot of you belong to Jesus. And, and you just need to know how incredible this is. That this story and these promises that you were an outsider to, you are now part of the family of God. That's, that's how Paul sa- uh, writes to the Ephesian Gentiles. He says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. You were like an orphan and you've been brought in. You've been adopted as children of God. This is now your story. Jesus is your Messiah. And that gets to the next thing that Paul says about about them, about the Romans. He says that you are loved by God. You are beloved. And this is a statement of identity too. And and isn't it incredible, my friends, that, that God genuinely loves us, that a holy God looks at us, And I'm sorry to break it to you, but you're a mess. And I'm a mess. We make a mess of things all the time. We're hard-hearted. We're hard-headed. You know, like like we're we're, we're so twisted in in our thinking, in 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 our hearts. And yet God genuinely loves us. This is why he sent Jesus, because of his great love. And so this is their identity. Before anything else, they are loved by God. And in Christ, this is your identity before anything else. You might wrestle with this question of identity in this world. You are loved by God. That's the rock solid basis on which to stand. And then he speaks of their their calling, their purpose. He says to them that you have been called to be God's holy people. This is their purpose. And actually even the holiness thing, before it's anything that you do, it's something that you are. The New Testament is clear about this again and again, that holiness, sanctification is something that God declares about you in your life. And and then the challenge, the thing the Spirit enables you to do is to be who you truly are, to live out your identity as a saint, as a holy one in the Lord. But it starts with that declaration. I, I think about how Paul begins a lot of his letters. He writes to the, the Corinthians and the Corinthians are... They are, like I said, you're a mess. The Corinthians, believe it or not, were even more messed up than you. This church was, was, had all kinds of issues. And Paul writes to them and starts by saying, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Wherever Paul speaks to Christians, he says, this is who you are. You are holy, now go and live it. Go and reflect God's character in the way you live. But this is your purpose as well. For everyone who is in Christ, this is your your purpose. It's it's not to make money. It's not to rack up likes and and compliments and so on. It It is to live out the holiness of Christ Jesus that he has declared in your life. I was trying to bring all of that together. The last thing that Paul says uh, in this introduction, the second part of verse seven, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's Paul, an apostle authorized to speak God's words, speaking to the Christians in Rome, these beloveds of God called to be holy people, Paul speaking to them, telling them that because of the gospel, because of this good announcement of the victory that Jesus has won, that they have grace and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. We're gonna keep on coming back to those two things because these are the gifts that come through the gospel, that come through Jesus. He came to give you grace and he came to give you peace. That grace, that forgiveness of sins that we do not deserve, being washed clean and declared to be right with God. That peace of having that relationship with him restored, that peace that transcends the circumstances of this life, that new identity that you are loved by God, redeemed, welcomed into that family, that new purpose that you are called to make him known and to live life in step with him. All of that grace and peace comes through the gospel to you. And so I I just wanna invite you and encourage you 
right here at the beginning of this letter as we enter into this, to receive that grace and that peace, to put your trust in Jesus, to allow him to say who you are, to receive that forgiveness of sins, to receive that right standing with him, and to enjoy that gift of grace and peace. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And I thank you, God, that here we read about the gospel. That in the midst of this world, the midst of our own, oh Lord, our own unsettledness, our own battles within us and outside of us, Lord. In a world where, where sin has wreaked havoc, I thank you so much, Lord, that you didn't leave us in that place, but that through Jesus Christ, you entered in. And Lord, that you have won the victory over these enemies that have oppressed us and kept us in bondage, that you have won the victory and that you now bless us, offer us your grace and your peace. So Lord, may that be among us today. May we be people of grace and peace. May we be people who like Augustine and Luther and Wesley, uh, Lord, receive that, that breakthrough that comes from knowing the gospel. That we are, we are not, we are not defined by our sins. We're not defined by what other people say about us, but that we are sanctified, beloved children of God because of the grace of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us at the Bridge Church in this way. If God has spoken to you through his word, or if you're wanting to reach out to pray, or just wanting to know more about our church, access our website. There you can connect with us and also have access to other contents. We are a church that lives to know Jesus Christ personally and to make him known. We believe he is the hope of the world and wants to give you hope as well. We believe the best news ever has come in and through him. May you know him more and make him known today. We'd love to hear from you.